Dunque, intanto l'autore del Satirico, Petronio, è un uomo straordinario ed è un uomo che muore suicida lui stesso perché è coinvolto in una congiura contro, contro Nerone. Questa è, è la verità. Tacitus gives us this really nice vignette, I guess, of this figure, Petronius, and particularly his role in Nero's court. Um, Petronius was a man who was kind of at the leading edge of culture and the refinement and the, the sort of uh, leisurely activities of, of Nero's court. And I guess that fits quite nicely with the image that we then want to have of the author of the text, that he's somebody who, you know, takes this kind of detached view of culture and observes what goes on um, and is also quite sort of bound up with perhaps the, the seamier side of things, you know, the underside of, of Roman society. Um, but then what Tacitus also does is, is he gives us this picture of his, his death, his suicide, uh, which is, is depicted in this very vivid way. Uh, he describes how he slits his wrists and then, kind of according to whim, binds them up and then unwraps them again so that his death becomes this drawn-out affair uh, during which he's also hosting a, a kind of banquet, listening to poetry, uh, but importantly, it's not serious poetry, it's sort of frivolous, um, and dozing in between so that ultimately when he dies, people would just think he's gone off to sleep. But before he dies, he composes this letter, we're told, uh, to Nero, which kind of condemns all of Nero's vices and uh, reveals all the secrets of his love affairs and so on. Um, so it's very easy, based on Tacitus's portrait, to see Petronius as this kind of scandalous figure, I guess. Uh, and he's been very appealing to popular culture because of that. Ma io penso che, la mia opinione è che Petronio, prima del satirico che poi lui ha scritto, sia stato uno dei, non so, dei narratori più potenti dell'intera storia del Romanità. Perché ha delle, come dire, delle intuizioni straordinarie the Satyricon itself is one of very few examples that we have of um, what we call ancient novels. Um, and by that I mean long, mostly prose narratives, although the Satyricon does also have quite a lot of poetry in there. Romanzi ne erano stati scritti in Grecia, ma erano romanzi patetici, di un patetismo, uh, come dire, di un patetismo uh, sdolcinato, così. Uh, il satirico è tutt'altro che un romanzo sdolcinato, è, è un romanzo di un realismo, di una potenza, è, è di una capacità di critica della società e al tempo stesso di una gioia della lotta. È, al tempo stesso di disperazione. People have described the tone of the satirican in, in a number of different ways. Um, my reading of it is that it's something quite light-hearted in tone. It's, it's quite comical. Um, it takes quite a, a sort of detached, um, you might say, a kind of amused view of the Roman society that it's depicting. When we hear satirican, I suppose in terms of English derivatives, the thing that we're most likely to associate it with is the idea of satire, um, which fits quite well with the, the sort of tone and the content of, of the novel itself. But the other key reference point um, is the idea of the satyr as um, a mythological figure, so the satyr being um, a kind of figure of, of mischief who could be associated with um, transgressive activities, lustful activities, and so it's believed that perhaps the title also connects with that sort of uh, mythological motif, and perhaps it blends the two, I think. Where we get the title Satyricon from um, is actually a longer title, which translated would mean essentially the books of 
the Satirica, um, and that gives us a sense of how originally the text would have been constructed as um, a series of books or chapters, we might think of them. And we know that what we actually have surviving today um, are sections of probably only three books in total, and we know that they're numbered 14, 15, and 16. So straight away, that indicates to us that if the whole of Petronius's text consisted of at least 16 books or chapters, and we only have bits of three of them, then we're looking at a very small proportion of the overall text. I think the fragment is absolutely the key feature of Petronius's narrative that appealed to Fellini, and I think it was a very conscious decision to maintain that sense of fragmentation um, in his finished film and perhaps even to increase it to make uh, the film seem even more fragmentary than the original text because in that image of the fragment, I think Fellini um, and people like Saponi, with whom he was collaborating on the screenplay, for them, that was just utterly symbolic of the state of our knowledge of antiquity. Um, and I'm sure that he reveled in the fact that um, echoing the fragmentation of Petronius's narrative allowed him to really upset the viewers of his film to destabilize them, to make them feel quite disorientated, to make them feel like it was difficult to follow what was happening. Um, because for him and for many other people who think about antiquity and what we know about it today, that really is how we relate to it. We struggle to make sense of it. We struggle to orientate ourselves in its narratives. Um, and the fragment just works so beautifully as a way of, of symbolizing that, both visually and in terms of the narrative. Il satiricon di Petronio, a realista, però il film non ha quasi niente. Può sembrare che il, il film abbia come sceneggiatura il romanzo del satirico. In realtà è tutto diverso. Restano naturalmente i capisaldi. Cioè, quali sono i capisaldi? I capisaldi sono i tre clerici vagantes, no? i tre piccoli delinquenti che girano il mondo, ma che sono clerici, sono degli studenti, diciamo così. No? Ha scelto il colpio e il più insinuante, l'amante dei due, che è Gitone. E questi restano. Trimacchione resta, ovviamente. Tanto che quello che si conosce di solito è la cena di Trimacchione. And in fact, uh, Trimalchio's dinner is really the only really extended episode that actually survives um, from Petronius's text. It's very much at the heart of what we have left. Tutto quello che fa saliva mi viene da un mio potere che chissà dov'è. Dicono che sta tra Terracina e Taranto. Il satirico è un romanzo della grande crisi dell'aristocrazia romana e della vittoria, se di vittoria si può chiamare, dei liberti, cioè degli, degli schiavi liberati. Il personaggio più noto, Trimacchione, è appunto uno schiavo che è diventato potentissimo. The dinner of Trimalchio is, is certainly the centerpiece of both Petronius's text and I think arguably Fellini's version of it. So when we're looking to try and understand exactly how much Fellini takes from Petronius, then that is um, the main point of, of overlap between the two. Petronius gives us really great details of um, the vulgarity and the kind of excess of uh, Trimalchio's banquet, which um, Fellini picks up on and also expands upon. 
se vuole un piccolo episodietto così, insomma, proprio grazioso, divertente, che riguarda anche come girava Federico, posso dire che durante la scena di Rimalchione, proprio mentre si girava la, la scena, voleva che due donne, cioè Magali Noel e un'attrice di cui non conosco il nome, però queste donne, queste due attrici si baciano, e però si baciano in modo sensuale, so, come fossero due lesbiche. E lui dice, ma no, così, no, baciate così, come, come due mignotte, no, come due tortore, come due lucertole. <ride> così lui dirigeva. Eh. There are other key aspects of Petronius which Fellini uses, and we can point to other um, fragments which migrate from Petronius's text to Fellini's film. So, for example, the little vignette which tells the story of the widow of Ephesus um, at the end of Trimalchio's feast is from Petronius, and certain other characters like the um, ship's captain, Lycas, that comes from Petronius too. Um, But although we get quite fixated on Petronius and it's quite easy to imagine that Fellini's film is essentially an adaptation of Petronius's text, there's also an awful lot of material in Fellini's satiricon which comes from elsewhere. Um, now, a lot of that might be from Fellini's own imagination, but we also have a sense of just how much might have come from other um, Latin texts of, of broadly the same era. So, for example, there's a later Latin novel by Apuleius, which was written about a century after Petronius, and there are quite striking similarities between that and Fellini's film. Um, we also can see aspects of um, poetry, for example, um, such as the uh, satires of Juvenal, who depicts a very memorable scene, for example, of the crumbling um, tenement buildings in ancient Rome, which we think then maps on to Fellini's own depiction. Fellini era un uomo di una discreta cultura. Ma niente di accademico, niente di scolastico, cioè, probabilmente è stato un cattivo studente, eccetera, eccetera. Però è un uomo di una intelligenza fulminante e di una genialità assoluta. But it's quite difficult to pin down Fellini's sources. He mentions using a lot of ancient authors like Horace and Ovid. Um, but I think that might have been more just that he was bandying those names around um, and perhaps again showing something of his magpie-like nature that he probably did read widely around those sources but he wasn't concerned to be scholarly in how he then took aspects of them and put it into his own work. I think it was a much more sort of free and easy attitude to that body of material. So, era uno che rubava a volo le cose. Eh? We know that, for example, Fellini spoke about using the work of Jerome Carcapino, who um, was quite a well-known name for having written this book on daily life in ancient Rome. It was really the very earliest days of perhaps taking a, a broader view of Roman culture, um, of being interested in anything outside the kind of elite political sphere. Non è un grandissimo testo che ecco pieno. Cioè, è, è molto utile, ci cioè, è pieno di informazioni, è simpatico, ma non è un gran testo di, di studio. One of the things we know about Petronius's novel is that some of its episodes are playing out not in Rome itself, but in other parts of Italy, and particularly the Bay of Naples. So it's usually assumed that Trimalchio's uh, house, for example, is located somewhere on the Bay of Naples. And that's quite significant because in antiquity there is this association between 
that particular area of, of Italy, Campania, um, with a certain kind of um, transgressive behaviour, a certain kind of licentious living, if you like. And I think it works very well for Fellini to pick up on that and take inspiration from what we know about the Bay of Naples today and particularly how it's interpreted in the popular imagination. So although there's no clear sense that anything in the satirican, either the novel or the film, happens in Pompeii, for example, which of course is another town in this area. Um, I think we do see that Pompeii is a very nice fit um, for what Fellini was trying to achieve in returning to Petronius's world. Um, so he capitalises on that association that we have between Pompeii and, again, the kind of extremes of Roman behaviour, um, you know, the erotica, the decadence, um, the sins and the vices, and that fits quite well with the version of Rome that Fellini wants to portray. And, for example, people latch on to the fact that in Pompeii we can go into these brothels and we can see kind of laid bare the reality of, of you know, what we imagine the Roman sex trade to have been like. We can see the frescoes on the walls which depict what would have happened in there and we can see graffiti which refers in very graphic detail to both what people might have, have purchased in the brothels and then also often reports on their kind of experiences afterwards. So those kinds of details, I think, must have been irresistible to Fellini. And we can see them being used in the film. So, yes, when we see our characters in the Sabura, in the back streets of Rome, and I think, yes, we get a sense of how Pompeii was being recycled for Fellini, if you like. He's using those images of the sort of menu of prostitutes' activities. And also the fact that Pompeii, again, it's symbolic of, I suppose, the fragmentation of antiquity for us today. You know, we think that it's this place that we can visit and access the ancient world as it really was, that we can go into the houses and we can experience Roman daily life almost at first hand. But, of course, that's not the case. You know, Pompeii is, is seductive, partly because there's so much of it that we just don't understand and that seems kind of alien and distant and difficult to comprehend for us. And so I think that's why Fellini found it to be a really powerful um, symbol and aesthetic, I think, for what he was trying to do. Ricorda che tu unita e fedela a lui per sempre, e tu sposo... Devi conoscere che il gusto di giovani ha avuto in passato. Tu devi dimenticarvi a obbedienza. The dubbing is hugely important and I think it's it's a very interesting element of the film that really destabilizes and unnerves people the first time that they watch it because there's a sense of, of dislocation and of not being able to tune in, I suppose, to the dialogue. But of course that's exactly how Fellini intended it to be. And actually, if we go back to some of the earlier ideas that he and his collaborators had for how the film might have been um, scripted and presented, um, it makes a lot more sense, for example, if we understand that one of their early ideas was to have the whole thing in Latin, um, which would have taken that sense of, of dislocation and um, incomprehensibility even further. Un lavoro concreto che io ho fatto per il per i film è scrivere in latino, nel latino poi che voleva eh, Fellini, tutta la sceneggiatura, cioè tutti i dialoghi della sceneggiatura. Io devo dirle che persino le immagini finali del satirico, quella dove si vede il mare, con questi volti di giovani, abbia persino civettato con il 68. Cioè la salvezza, il mare, la libertà è nei giovani. E i giovani allora erano il 68. I think that Fellini must have felt that Petronius really allowed him um, to engage with that whole 
countercultural hippie world that was obviously really fascinating to him in the late 1960s and beyond. Um, and certainly in the context of his film Satyricon, um, he regularly repeated these anecdotes which um, give a, a kind of a context for the film in that way. So he talks about casting key actors like Max Born, who were previously unknown, but who he sort of literally plucked off a street corner as a kind of an archetypal hippie. And then stories of the film's premiere apparently taking place at Madison Square Gardens in front of a whole audience of hippies who... Um, you know, were kind of smoking and drinking and making love as they were watching the film. And it's probably apocryphal, but for Fellini, that seems to um, give the kind of frame that he wants for the film, that he wants to show Petronius's world, that world of first century Rome, is somehow akin to the cultural revolution that's, that's in some sense currently underway for him. Ho il senso che si ha eh, vedendo il film e dall'altra parte conoscendo Fellini che, che l'atteggiamento di fronte al mondo è un atteggiamento di grande distacco. Ma di fronte al mondo, cioè di fronte all'umanità, di fronte... E infatti Fellini è un personaggio che è, di, è difficilissimo parlare di Fellini. Tutti ne parlano dicendo varie cose, anche sballate, cioè, raccontando cose, storie, storielle, eccetera, eccetera. Ma no, Fellini è un personaggio indecifrabile e per questo parlo anche di distacco. I think Fellini's Satyricon is still almost unparalleled in terms of the vision of antiquity that it gives us as something which is difficult to access, incomprehensible, um, alien and fragmentary. Because still, for the most part, popular culture today wants to look back to antiquity as something that we can relate to and feel quite comfortable with, um, that we can kind of chart our descent from, if you like. Um, but I think that's not necessarily the fairest or the most accurate way of understanding our relationship to antiquity. And I think Fellini knew that. I think that he really wanted to demonstrate and to get people thinking about how, if we assume that antiquity was something that we could understand or that people in ancient Rome were just like us, that might be quite a deceitful view of things. And it's certainly not necessarily um, an authentic representation of how things were. So he wanted to show us that actually antiquity might be completely unintelligible. Um, and that's something that we really need to hold on to, I think, this idea that although there certainly would be things that we understand if we could transport ourselves back to first century Rome, it's just as likely that there would be very many things about that world that made no sense to us whatsoever. And what Fellini does in his film is, is really demonstrate that 